prep best every day. Wow, good evening and welcome. My name is Jeff Sokran and I am a very proud member of Prep's class of 1985. It gives me tremendous pleasure to serve as your Masters of Ceremonies for the 2022 Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame induction ceremony. These are truly hallowed grounds for for me, and I'm sure for many of our alumni that are present here this evening, I, I have to tell you, um, it, it's funny. Uh, as my alter ego, which is Dr. Sock from Island 92 Radio on St. Martin, I get to host all kinds of events like this all the time. And I have to be 100% honest with you, this is my first time hosting here at Prep, and you know, butterflies are normal, I've been a nervous wreck all day long. And um, go figure, go figure. As we begin this evening, I'd like to ask you to step back in time with me for just a minute, if you would. Almost 41 years ago, just about, I recall sitting on a McAuliffe lawn on a hot and sticky day in September. And uh, it was the first time the entire freshman class of 1985 assembled for the very first time for a welcome assembly. Our headmaster back in the day, Father Bowler, sorry Christian, we didn't have a president then, <laughs> um, uttered these words and I still remember them to this very day. I wonder if anybody else here does as well. Um, they weren't original words, but they were words that were tweaked and paraphrased and adjusted from the late John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States. And Father Bowler told us as we began our careers here, your days here are numbered. Indeed they are. Ask not what Fairfield Prep can do for you. Ask what you can do for Fairfield Prep. These words, this message are so deeply rooted in my very beings. And just like Prep Athletics, they helped me, and dare I say just about every alumnus that has gone through our halls of this great institution become a man for others. The rich and historic tradition of prep athletics can stand against any high school program in the country and dare I say just about anywhere in the world. From a big round of applause. <laughs> From undefeated championship teams to thousands of student athletes to hundreds of All-State players and a handful who have gone on to play professionally. The history of prep athletics continues to get stronger and stronger each year. Tonight, we honor five individuals and one championship team who have paved their legacy into our history. Before we begin, to all the alumni in the audience tonight, 
whether you're here on campus regularly or this is your first visit back in some time, doesn't the place look fantastic? Holy cow! <laughs> Let me say, welcome home. It feels incredible for me to be here. And I've been, you know, bothering Christian for pretty regularly lately, but it really does feel good to be home. And to all of you watching online, we're so happy that you're with us tonight. Thank you for being here. To begin tonight's program, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Preps President Christian Cashman to make a few remarks about his new strategy and vision for Preps future. I can definitely tell you without a doubt that Prep is in good hands and I know our very best days are yet to come. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of Fairfield Prep, my very good friend, Mr. Christian Cashman. Well, good evening to the prep athletic community. Allow me to add my warm welcome and gratitude for this great evening of prep tradition, the Athletic Hall of Fame. And certainly thanks to Doc Sock, Jeff Sacker, and the class of 85 for leading us in this wonderful evening. Thanks to our advancement team, especially our dear friend Kathy Norell. Can we hear for Kathy and her team for pulling off this amazing evening? To the Hall of Fame committee, to Lou Pintech, class of 72, for his incredible research and all of the support here tonight. At this time, I would like to also ask our past Hall of Fame inductees to stand and be recognized here this evening. I think we have at least two or three of our past members here tonight. If you could please stand and be honored tonight as inductees of the Hall of Fame. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Matt. Tom Roach, thank you. So I offer my heartfelt congratulations to this evening's Hall of Fame inductees, to Bob, to Ron, Brian, Chris, Bob, and the great 97 cross country team. I say well done and God bless you. I am so thrilled along with Jeff to welcome you back home to North Benson. Serving in my second year as the 17th president of PrEP, it has been a true honor and a privilege and I tell everyone that I see there's nowhere I'd rather be than with this great and amazing PrEP team. The joke, as you may have heard, is you may not have a Jesuit, but you have a Christian. So I'm doing what I can to keep the tra traditions alive. Uh, the last two years, needless to say, have not been easy. Uh, but I feel blessed by our families, our alums, our great benefactors, our friends, our faculty, our boys, and the faith of our Jesuit community. I want to assure all gathered here tonight, but especially you wonderful alumni of the decades, that Fairfield Prep remains strong. And in fact, I would say as strong as ever, for we men and women formed by the Jesuits, ruined for life as we say, consider it our vocation to ensure a prep education for the whole person, mind, body, and spirit as we celebrate the 80th year. We are enjoying, for your information, two of the strongest enrollment classes in a decade at Fairfield Prep. We will welcome 220 boys in the freshman class to prep next fall. <clears throat> And uh, a stat for the, for the uh, gridiron guys in here, over 130 prepsters came out for the football team alone last year, and the prep freshmen went 10-0. Uh, and 0. So prep men continue to post amazing results in athletics, artistic uh, endeavors, and academic life. We are annually granting $3 million of scholarship and financial aid to over 42% of Fairfield prep families to ensure access. We have just received the single largest gift in PrEP's history from Dr. Jim and April Barrett, class of 60, for $5 million to support boys at Fairfield PrEP. Let's thank Jim and April Barrett for their generosity. <clears throat> so PrEP is strong today because of your generosity, because of alums and friends and, and dear benefactors. And for 80 years, PrEP Athletics has been the second classroom for thousands of young men, young men who are tested in the fires of competition. And even in the pain of loss, as we know this year, and losing a, a teammate and a classmate in Jimmy McGrath in the class of 23. And they are supported by the bonds of brotherhood and team. As a prep father of four sons, three of whom have grown into men here on our prep teams, I have per personally witnessed the transformative power of prep athletics. 
Nowhere is the Jesuit mantra, men for others, more relevant or lived than on the field, on the court, in the water, in the pool, on the ice. Tonight, our inductees now join the unbroken chain of prep men who have given selflessly to a higher goal for team, for brotherhood, for prep pride. It's a genuine honor to be with you this evening and to celebrate these great men in prep's athletic history. In the famous words of Father Tommy Murphy, we may laugh, we may cry, but we never say die. Let's go, Fairfield. Fairfield, let's go. Thank you and hail prep. Thank you, Mr. President. Those words, they ring home. They really do ring home. I'd also like to extend a, I know uh, Christian message in this as well, but I'd also like to expand, extend a very special thank you to the Athletic Hall of Fame Selection Committee members who have uh, really had their work cut out for them and uh, choosing this outstanding class, uh, given Prep's proud athletic history, that's not an easy task. And uh, thank you for, for organizing such a wonderful, wonderful event. And I also have to say a personal thank you to the, the whole development office because they have been nothing but rock stars in helping me prepare for this evening. So Kathy, uh, Kathy Norell and your team, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart and your entire team. Tonight, our inductees exemplify the very definition of educating the mind the body, and the spirit. They are tremendous examples of men for others. Men who have carried the Fairfield Prep name with honor, with pride, and in the purest sense, what a Jesuit education at Fairfield Prep truly, truly means. So tonight, we celebrate, from the class of 1951, a star athlete whose basketball playing days started at the very beginning of prep athletics history, Mr. Bob Gerwin. From the class of 1955, playing both basketball and baseball, and excelled at both, Mr. Ron Liptak. From the class of 1981, getting kind of close to my generation here on North Benson Road, a three-sport athlete at prep, and played football at UConn after high school, Mr. Brian McGillicuddy. From the class of 1990, an all-state linebacker who went, who went on after high school to play football at Cornell, Mr. Chris Zingo. And a teacher, a coach, my athletic director, my phys ed teacher, here at Fairfield Prep for more than 30 years, Mr. Bob Harris. <laughs> and finally, the team who ranked 15th nationally, who is still regarded as one of the best cross country teams at Fairfield Prep. We honor the 1997 varsity cross country team. <laughs> this is not only a celebration of prep and its athletic program, but more importantly, the alumni who have helped shape Fairfield Prep Athletics into what it is today. Currently, the school offers 35 athletic teams in 17 sports. Every student athlete today continues to build upon the legacy and the tradition that was started so many years ago. As we applaud the current success of Fairfield Prep, tonight we honor the student athletes who came before them. To all of our inductees, congratulations on this wonderful night. And congratulations to your families. And on behalf of our president, Christian Cashman, and everyone in here at Prep, and our alumni and our parents, and all the friends watching at home, we're delighted and honored to have you forever be part of our school and our athletic hall of fame. So enough with the inductions, let's get started. What do you think, are we ready? 
Are we ready? I can't hear you. Are we ready? That's better. That's better. One year after his lifelong friend and basketball teammate, Jack O'Connell from the class of 51. And I think I met Jack tonight. Jack, are you here? I thought I met Jack. There, there, yes, I did meet me, Jack. He, uh, Jack was inducted into the uh, Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh, Bob Gerwin takes his rightful place in the Athletic Hall of Fame alongside him tonight. The Bridgeport native was a two-year starter at Prep, a rugged rebounder who averaged 14.2 points per game and was selected to the all-district team. During his time with the Jesuits, they compiled a 34-13 record and upset regional powers Central, Harding, and Hill House all along the way. That's pretty amazing. Gerwin was selected to Prep's All-Decade Team, 1942 to 1951, and then accompanied O'Connell to Fairfield University, where he moved right in and started all four seasons. He led the Stags in rebounding and registered 1,062 career points. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attentions to the big screen as we honor Mr. Bob Gerwin from the class of 1951. Robert Gerwin, class of 1951. When we were growing up, Fairfield Prep was a frequent topic of conversation, usually from our grandmother. She reminisced about her fond memories of dad playing ball. He was outstanding, you know, and so smart. The years at the Prep, with their outstanding staff and curriculum, along with athletics, definitely got our father ready for Fairfield University and beyond. Aside from his love of basketball that was nurtured at the prep, dad was lucky to have his best friend alongside him for their adventures. Jack O'Connell was a household name for us, as dad would frequently reminisce about their years together on the basketball court and off. They'd played together since the early years at Blessed Sacrament, at the prep, and through their college years at the university. There were weddings, children, careers and losses, all shared in a bond of friendship that carries on to this day. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell, for being such an important part of our dad's life. My father is a really outstanding human being. Wherever he is, whatever he's doing, he's making an impact on other people's lives. He is a man of character, of strength, and of faith. And he has been a pillar for our family as well as the entire Immaculate High School community. He's led through example, a trait he no doubt learned from the Jesuits at the prep. The Jesuits informed many of dad's thoughts and direction as he moved forward from school into his adult life. The strong faith formation he received at the prep continues to comfort and guide him onward. I know that dad's a little bit embarrassed, but very grateful to be accepted into this hall of fame. He's a man who strives for the best at all things, and in this case, playing basketball. To get recognized by this organization for his excellence is a real honor for all of us. My name is Kathy Gerwin Pinto, and it is my honor to present the best daddy a girl could ever ask for, my dad, Robert Gerwin, for enshrinement into the Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me and welcoming Mr. Bob Gerwin to the stage. I got to meet him on the way in tonight. What a gentleman. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Gerwin. Thank you very much. First of all, first of all, at 89 years old, they all talk about the memories. I don't know if anybody in here remembers North Benson Road. I walked up and down it on a Saturday because I had to go to Jug. <laughs> I don't even know if they use that word anymore. 
They still have jug? Absolutely. All right. The quiz. What do the three letters mean? Jug. Everyone remembers that. I thought Jack O'Connell was the only one that remembered it. Because I certainly didn't. I want to also thank Kathy Norell, the alumni director, for making me a part of the group that's installed and inducted tonight into the Hall of Fame. I want to also thank my family and my friends for being here to share this special evening. Uh, they mentioned Jack O'Connell. Jack and I go back longer than most of you have even been alive. 84 years. We started back in 1938. We went to a grammar school together at Blessed Sacrament in Bridgeport. We've played all years always together, never played against each other in our, our careers, which was kind of strange. But Jack and I, as I say, have enjoyed the friendship for many, many years. Uh, I also want to thank my daughter, Kathy. Kathy did a terrific job on the video. Thank you, Kathy. I'm lost completely. They asked me if I knew how to send that down to Kathy <laughs> Norello. And I said, you have to be kidding. <laughs> I'm lucky if I can still see it. <laughs> but I want to thank my family and friends for being here to, to share with me this special honor. Uh, Jack and I, when we left, we were in, like I said, we were in grammar school at Blessed Sacrament. And from there, we went to Middle Street Boys Club. And we were lucky to be members of the club, so we got to play basketball. And we played for the All-State team, uh, which was made up of players. Today, I guess they call them AAU players and uh, whatever. But that was the time when, uh, when we did that. Now, Jack and I started playing on, we said, the same team in seventh grade. And we played all those many years together. Never once, though, did we ever play against each other. But Jack and I then moved on to prep. And we were joined by many very good players. Some of them you may remember. Johnny Miyako, Freddie Lane. Swing and Serto, and Babe Risley. That was just to mention a few. Then we went on to Fairfield University. The two best scorers I ever played with or against were both at Fairfield University. One was Joe Kehoe, one of the very few first players at Immaculate. I think he was a junior or a senior when we were freshmen. Joe was the first player to score 1,000 points at Fairfield University. Then Jack O'Connell. He was the third player to score 1,000 points at Fairfield University. And in between these two great scorers was a player who could just about see the rim. I was happy when I hit the rim. <laughs> uh, I was not the best offensive player but my contribution was rebounding. And Jack always reminded me, if you go in there and get a lot of offensive rebounds, the shot is only three or four feet, so you should be able to make it from there. <laughs> that was when he was happy and allowed me to shoot. <laughs> Jack and I are still good friends. With our brothers, we go to breakfast once or twice a month, and before I leave, I want to just thank the Jesuits, particularly the ones at PrEP. My president, or it wasn't a president at the time, the principal was Father Kennedy. And the dean of students was um, Father Munzing. 
He remember Father Munzee? He's that he's my favorite Jesuit who gave me that walk up and down North Benson Road. And I was delighted to do it because he treated me as an adult and a regular person and said, I will not call your parents. As long as you come here with your water pistol and you clean the steps on Xavier Hall. I think I'm giving the wrong impression that I've spent a lot of time on, in Jug. Actually, only twice, but I remembered it, that's for sure. The Jesuits were responsible for whatever success I had in my years as an educator. I was 37 years in education. 32 years I spent at a high school in Danbury, Immaculate High School. I was a math teacher, a coach, the athletic director, and the administrator for all those years. In my last 22, I served as the, the president. Uh, that's, not, that's a lie. Actually, I was the principal. <laughs> I quit when they said I had to be the, the president which meant I had to go out and raise money, which I, I was not really good at that, Kathy. So come and see my brother or see Jack. Uh, I learned one thing, though, about public speaking. First, stand up so you can be seen. And then speak up so you will be heard. And then sit down so you will be appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you. A big round of applause. Mr. Bob Gerwin. And by the way, Bob, I remember Father Munzing. He taught, he taught me English in 1981 when I was a freshman here. <laughs> I wish I could, well, I tried. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you, Bob. Moving along, tough and talented Ron Liptak excelled in both basketball and baseball at Fairfield Prep, and he is one of the few select athletes who played in both the Little League World Series and the College World Series. In between, the six foot one Liptak was a power forward for Coach George Bisakas Jesuits leading the team in scoring and rebounding in his junior and senior seasons. The co-captain set a school record with 32 points in the Eastern States Catholic Invitational in Newport, Rhode Island in 1955. Liptak was a standout shortstop starting all four seasons for prep coach Ted Seymour and served as a captain in his senior season. He received a basketball and baseball scholarship to Holy Cross, where he helped the Crusaders to a third place finish in, 1950, in the 1958 College World Series. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screens as we honor Ron Liptak from the class of 1955. Ronald Liptak, class of 1955. Hi everyone, hi dad. My name is Kim, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my sisters, Karen and Kathy. First of all, we're thrilled to be here not only as the daughters of an inductee, but to be amongst all of the other amazing athletes here tonight as well. Secondly, and for the record, the three of us were all supposed to be named Michael Charles after Mickey Mantle. But dad got stuck with three girls, and Karen wouldn't let him name her son, so no Mickey in the family. Sorry, dad. Obviously, we were not around when Ron was a young athlete, so we cannot speak to those experiences. But we have firsthand knowledge of the wonderful man that was shaped by his athletic career at Fairfield Prep. His athletic experiences at Fairfield Prep included playing varsity baseball his freshman and sophomore years. And his junior and senior years, he played both baseball and basketball and was leading rebounder and scorer for basketball both years. He was even voted best athlete his senior year. But his passion for sports was not just about physical ability and competition. He has shared countless stories with us about how influential his friends and most importantly, his basketball coach, George Basaka, were to him. 
His coaches and teammates taught him more than just baseball and basketball. They taught him the importance of being part of a team, commitment, pride and humility, and building friendships that would last a lifetime. From the Little League World Series to the summer softball leagues, from his high school basketball to the tens of thousands of handball games at the YMCA, and from his Holy Cross college career to his daily gym workouts that he maintains to this very day, he has been loved and respected by his peers and fellow athletes. Dad has always been and clearly always will be an athlete. He was even signed to the Milwaukee Braves in 1958 as a college senior, but shortly thereafter was drafted into the Army and willingly gave up his lifelong dream to serve his country. But Dad was not only successful as an athlete, he worked for the same company for over 35 years, was married to the love of his life for over 50 years, and always maintains and shares his strong faith. But one of his proudest accomplishments is that he has donated over 28 gallons of blood in his lifetime, and he will continue to do so as long as they'll take it. Dad has been the most generous and loving father to the three of us girls, who honestly did not always share his enthusiasm for sports, but he did eventually help us find our individual athletic talents and taught us how to properly yell at the television when things aren't going our team's way. But most importantly, he has taught us dedication, integrity, and that devotion to family and friends is everything. And win or lose, he has given us the courage, strength, and support to follow our own dreams. We are truly blessed to have you as our father, Ron, and we love you more than words could ever say. My name is Kim Liptak, and it is my honor to present our father, Ronald Liptak, for enshrinement into the Fairfield Prep Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Dad. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fairfield Prep Hall of Fame welcomes Mr. Ron Liptak. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> I, I really mean that. I I don't know what to say to my children, but I'd first of all like to extend my congratulations to the other honorees here tonight. I cite you by name, but that's I have trouble remembering my own name at times. But <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I'm certainly so happy to see the number of friends that I have that came to here and uh, it's just wonderful it really is it's a wonderful feeling and uh, I just look at Louie, Kenny and Mickey and the rest of the guys and I'm, we go back a long way and uh, I remember we had I may have been the leading scorer and I'm going to tell you about Louie Louie doesn't forgive me but he, he says we used to practice practice in every practice for two years with George Basak. I would come out to the key and they'd throw the ball to me. And they would crisscross and practice. I'd throw the ball, give the ball to one of them. Usually worked. But he said, it's been 70 years, Liptak. And he says, you never once passed me the ball in a game. <laughs> 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 so anyway, but it's so thank you for coming. <clears throat> When I first got the word about my nomination, I was obviously quite thrilled. And a lot of things go through your mind. And uh, two things really hit me. It's not very original, but the two things were, two things were family and sacrifice, parents. And, uh, I was a very, very fortunate kid. I really was. I, uh, I grew up with wonderful parents. I, uh, we, I, I grew up in a wonderful time. It was right after World War II, and uh, I, 
I lived in a little village, seaside village in the south end of Bridgeport, and down at the end of that street, there was a lot. And brother, that was important because we spent so much time at that lot every day. We'd go there in the summertime to play baseball. Fall, we'd play football. In the winter, we'd go up to a street on Atlantic Street, and even in the wintertime, play basketball. That's where we learned. In baseball, we would go there, and believe me, it wasn't very uncommon, or it was uncommon, excuse me, it was uncommon to get at least 18 guys to play a baseball game, uh, which is a wonderful way to hone your skills. No question about it. But we were, when we were young, we were playing not just guys our own age, but guys who were even back from the war were playing. So you're playing against experienced guys, and it was a tremendous way to learn. <clears throat> I, uh, I love sports. I, was, I didn't realize, that, you know, you don't really as a kid, but I, I did. I loved sports tremendously, and prob probably to a fault. And I say so because when my professional career ended, uh, baseball, and I came into the real world and raising kids and everything, the one thing I wasn't very good at and never paid any attention to is things like fixing things and <laughs> repairing <laughs> things. So I, my wife said to me one day, in, in not a very fuzzy or warm tone, she said, you, you, you should have been a poster boy for the Yellow Pages. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was true, believe me, and it still is. I, uh, I'd just like to say a couple words. We talk about parents and sacrifice. I'd like to say a couple words about my dad. Um, he was so important in my life, as was my mother. But my father grew up with a fairly large family in 1900. And it was tough. His father died when he, he hardly ever, ever knew his father. And uh, he had a third grade education because he actually had to go out and work. Bring something home for the family because it was very difficult. But he was a very good athlete, my father. He really was. And it led on to him playing ball and becoming, getting a job at a factory and learning to become a toolmaker, which he worked for many, many years. But he also, he also was very adventurous. He was he, uh, he tried other things. He tried, he tried the gas station business, and which, by the way, I saw a picture of him the other day next, next to a gas pump. It was 11 cents a gallon. <laughs> but, but, uh, but in any way, he did. But he did more than that. I, you know, you, you forget about things, and you, you take things for granted. And uh, I think we all do that. Uh, so, he, he, somebody asked me, and I think, I think it was Chris, I swear to God, he asked me, who, who, was, your, uh, who was your hero? Do you, you ever have a hero? Well, I think he was looking for sports, which would have been DiMaggio when I was a little kid. But it was a very easy answer. It, it was my father. No question about it. Uh, I mentioned maybe sacrifice. Sacrifice. I, I never saw a man work so hard, he, even when he, he had a restaurant or he had a little parking lot downtown Birchport. Uh, he, he still would work as a tool maker, but he worked two jobs. Now, I'm, I know a lot of you people, people my age, parents, you can probably identify with that. It was hard. Those people worked hard. Jobs were hard to come by. But they did it. They did it. And when time came... I have a brother who went to prep. He was my older brother. And when time came for my brother to go to high school, Fairfield Prep had pretty much just started. And uh, to my father had heard about it, my mother, and I guess there was, you know, what, what is this school and all that. But, it, you know, it often, he listened to it. Well, it cost money to go there. Nothing like it does now. But that didn't matter. I'll work extra to send him there. And uh, anybody, you know, any but those people, they lived under, under the, the during the Great Depression, and a few dollars, which is what it cost then, was a lot of money. 
but he said no. People who lived in those days really understood the value of education because they didn't get it. It was very difficult to come by. So he he uh, they, they sent my brother to school to prep, and of course I came here, and I would never regret ever having come to the prep. I know it's ex unbelievably expensive now and everything, but what I understand, <laughs> uh, and it's true today. Any anybody, parents want something better for their children, better. They want something. They want to give them the best opportunity. If they can do it, good parents do it. As I said, I'm very fortunate to be here tonight. The only the only regret I have is that I lost my beautiful wife Beverly just a few years ago. Hopefully she's looking down, down on myself and my beautiful children who I love so dearly, Karen, Kathy, and Kim. And I'm s I can't believe what they did with that video. It's amazing. I want to thank you very much, each and every one of you, and God bless you. Big round of applause for Ron Liptak. Inspirational words. Thank you, Ron. Ah. Oh. One of Fairfield's Preps rare three sport stars, Brian McGillicuddy, was both talented and feisty. Whether excelling as a wide receiver and a defensive back in football, setting the table as a leadoff hitter in baseball, or mixing it up as a point guard on the basketball court, McGillicuddy was always involved. McGillicuddy was a two-time All-NBA selection in football in 1979 and 1980, an All-NBA choice in baseball in 1981, an honorable mention all NBA pick in basketball in 1981. He went on to have an outstanding collegiate career at UConn, where he led the Huskies in receiving in his junior and senior seasons, and he finished his career as the school's second all-time leading receiver. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the big screens as we honor Brian McGillicuddy from the class of 1981. Brian McGillicuddy, class of 1981. My name is Steve McGillicuddy. I'm the brother of Brian McGillicuddy. I was class of 1977, uh, Brian class of 1981. Anybody who knows the history of our family knows how important prep is. I mean, it's the only thing we've ever really known. In order to talk about Brian or talk about anybody, we really have to bring my father in because he instilled in us what prep was all about. My father was the first lay principal here, was a dean of discipline. He's a assistant principal. He was here for 42 years. He was inducted into the original Hall of Fame before they started the Athletic Hall of Fame. As far as Bry, when he came into prep, he was 5'3", like 110 pounds. He had been a great player on Pop Warner, but then he comes to prep and there's all these big kids. And he was a running back and he played, but he didn't play a ton. And he was a good player and he also played baseball and basketball, the same as his son, Max. I mean, he always played three sports, so I always wanted to kind of take after him. And I looked up to him playing all three of those sports. So just kind of wanted to be like him and try and accomplish what he did at prep. And then by junior year, Bry grew to six feet, like 150 pounds. He uh, played for Earl Lavery, who was my father's best friend. Both had gone to Holy Cross, both came to prep around the same time, so it was great for Bry to be able to play for Earl. Same thing in basketball. Bry was on a junior year, he played a lot. He was the seventh man. And then baseball season he played, and he played for Ed Rowe, and was a terrific player. Now what made Bry, I think, really great about him was that he was so humble. As successful as he was, never ever, you know, it's all about me, because my father always said, there's like a couple things I want you to do. Don't embarrass me, play hard, and don't complain. Unfortunately, I always didn't do that, but Bry did. <laughs> and I think here's a story about how we never really cared about the individual awards. Baseball season came and he was tremendous and he made all daily news. His trophy from the daily news came and it was this really huge trophy and it came broken. And instead of making a big deal about it, 
calling the Daily News, getting to, we just say, ah, forget it, it's fine. You, you got the award, you don't have to worry about the trophy. And that's the way he was. He was just really humble. To describe my dad, I would just say he's such a caring guy and really cares about everyone else. It's never about him, it's about everyone else. And I saw that with me playing sports. He always cared about how well I did. Then when we get into senior year, Bry happened to have a great football season. And one of the proudest things I think my father ever had was when Earl Avery called and said Bry was voted the most valuable player of the NBA. Bry never came off the field. He ran the kickoffs back, he ran the punts back, he played free safety, he played wide receiver. They'd put him in the backfield sometimes to hit him the ball, make sure he had it. And they had a tremendous season, and that evolved into him getting a scholarship to UConn. Growing up, most kids have their favorite athletes hung up in the room, and that was the case for me, except instead of Tom Brady, I had my pictures of my dad playing football at UConn. While I've always thought my dad was the greatest, it wasn't until my own time at prep that I realized how many lives he's impacted, aside my own, and how many people admire him like I do. One of the great things, I've had so many people come up to me and said, you know, I came to prep because I used to come when I was small and watch your brother. And it's like he was you know, such a great player and it made me want to go here. That's something you don't hear every day. Like for people to say that to you about him makes you proud of him and it should make him feel really good because they don't always say that to that person. Prep means a lot to our family, and I think for him, being inducted really shows all of his hard work and how much he did at prep and what great of an athlete he really was. So it does mean a lot for him, and it means a lot to our family to show that he is that good of an athlete, and it proves to me that he is that guy that everyone talks about, because I never really got to see him play, obviously, but everyone always talked to him about him being so good, so now I really get to see how good he really was at prep. My name is Steve McGillicuddy. I'm Max McGillicuddy. And it is our honor to present my brother, and my dad, Brian McGillicuddy, for induction into the Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame. Congrats, my man. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming, along with the Fairfield Prep Hall of Fame, Mr. Brian McGillicuddy. I think we should just play the video again. <laughs> just hang out for a while, right? Uh, what, a, what a great honor to have my brother and my son give the speech. It just, it means the world to me. Steve, it's so nice to know that you have feelings. It took us, <laughs> took us a few years to get there, but I really do appreciate it. And for anybody who knows Steve, they know that's true, right? Good evening and thank you all. What a tremendous night and I'm so humbled and honored with such an accomplished group of, athletic, of athletes. Um, I would like to congratulate each and every one of them for this well-deserved honor. I'd first like to start by saying some thank yous. Um, my mother, who is here, who is 91 years young, I want to say thank you for all the sacrifices that you and dad made. I know it wasn't easy carting me around, getting me to all my ball games, but um, you allowed me to do what I did, and I really, really appreciate that. To my brother Steve, my sister Patty, who passed a few years ago, and to my sister Kathy, your support was incredible. You guys were always at every game. You felt the pain and the happiness just the way I did. And I know that you were my biggest fans, and I can't thank you enough. I'd also like to send a big thank you to Dennis Brown. Um, Dennis, your nomination has truly touched me, and I can't thank you enough for all the time you spent to try to get me into the hall. We finally did it, buddy, right? <laughs> and to the Hall of Fame committee, I would just like to say thank you for all your hard work and your and all the time that you put in, it really is a special night and it means so much to all of us. And to one more special guest, I have to say thank you. Father Levins, thank you so much for making the trip down. Um, we adopted you years and years and years ago. 
And it is so special to have you a part of our family, and we all really sincerely mean that. Thank you so much. Uh, my journey of prep took a little different path than most. Um, we're a prep family, as my, ro my brother said. And as you know, my dad working here for 42 years um, and making the Hall of Fame, it was really, really special when my dad got in. Um, my brother went here, my nephew Michael went here, my son Max went here, my brother-in-law Tim Foley went here. It just seemed like there was no other choice. We were going to prep no matter what. And it is the place that we always thought it would. It's a fabulous, fabulous place. Um, our babysitters and our earliest uh, memories of PrEP were, um, well, let, let me back up a step. My parents moved down from Worcester, Massachusetts. They didn't know anybody except PrEP. So they didn't have access to babysitters. So all of the PrEP, all of the prep boys were our babysitters. So my first memory of a keg party was the boys throwing a, keg party in the backyard. My parents went to New York and I think there were about 150 people and when my father and my uncle came home they were so mad they kicked everybody out and then they proceeded to sit at the keg for about five hours, the two of them, <laughs> which anyone that knows my dad knows that he liked the cocktail, right? Um, but you know, great memory. Um, my brother's first cigarette when he was 10 was from a prep babysitter, you know? <laughs> I, think, I think they called, my, when my parents called to check on him, they said, can Steve have another cigarette? <laughs> I'm not kidding, this is, this is real. <laughs> uh, and then the greatest one, I think it was New Year's Eve, my mom and dad went out and the prep babysitters decided to have a few cocktails inside and then they passed out so when my folks came home, they didn't have a key, so my mother went through the window and got in, and then they woke the boy up, and then they spent about four hours trying to sober him up before he could send him home to their family. I mean, so great memories, uh, great role models, and um, through all that, I still decided to come here, right? Um, Obviously, prep is important to my family, as you well know, and um, I think the prep culture and family is important to prep culture. Um, we certainly experienced that in the years when my son went here, and we were so thrilled to be re-engaged. But I remember my brother and my father taking me to games when I was a, a young boy, and I remember watching a guy named Paul Hallis, who most of us know Paul Hallis, probably the best athlete that ever came through here. And I remember saying that day that I saw him down at uh, Stanford at Thanksgiving Day that I wanted to be just like Paul Hallis. So our stories are really similar, to be honest with you. Um, he played football, baseball, and basketball, and so did I. And he played football and baseball in college. I played football at UConn, had a chance to play baseball, but didn't feel physically that I could do two sports. And then Paul went on to Harvard. Um, I, I didn't. <laughs> but now we're both in the Hall of Fame, so I think pretty cool we ended up at the same place, right? <laughs> so my brother said 53110. It was actually 52105. I was strapping. My first football coach happens to be here tonight. He's getting inducted into the Hall of Fame, Bob Harris. And Bob went to my dad and said, I'm, um, I'm afraid to play him. He's too small. He's going to get hurt. <laughs> so I played half the game. The agreement, probably over a beer, was I could play half the game. Um, it was really challenging. Being so small was, was really tough. Um, but I had one thing that I knew could work, and that was speed. So I kind of always felt like I was the underdog. Um, it wasn't easy having a father at the school. You know, naturally kids thought that I got preferential treatment. If I was playing, they were uh, not so happy. Um, and I was really under a microscope and it was really difficult for my dad because these were his best friends. So I had to work really, really hard to make sure that I got in the lineup and I belonged there. So again, not easy, um, but I had to work. 
And I think that would be a message to the young kids. You don't get anything handed, you have to go grab it and you have to work hard. I was very fortunate to play for some outstanding coaches, um, Hall of Fame coaches, Earl Lavery and Ed Rowe. And we had uh, a great newcomer uh, named Doug Melody who coached our basketball team our senior year. All different styles. Uh, Lavery was stoic, Rowe expressive. <laughs> Don't ever hit the ball back up the middle, right? We know that. Um, and, uh, and then Melody, who was just, he was just tough as nails. Uh, but they all taught me one lesson, and, and that lesson was, if you're going to lace it up, you might as well win. And I remember Coach Lavery saying one day, when somebody questioned him about three yards and a cloud of dust offense, and he said, don't be good at a bunch of things. Be great at a few. Always kind of stuck with me, right? I had to figure my spot and do what I could do and not more or not less. As fortunate as I was to have outstanding coaches, I was just as fortunate to play with some fabulous players and better people. Um, I want to thank all of my teammates. Some of them are here tonight. You guys made the world to me. You really do. We won a ton of games over four years and have some great memories, uh, but they aren't always about wins and losses. They're about the people that we went to war with. One game I remember my senior year, we were playing Stratford High School, and we're playing under the lights, and back then we got about 5,000 people to the game, and, you know, it was exciting, and you could feel the energy in the air. And, well, before the game, uh, my teammate Tony Capuano, who had grown up eating his mother's homemade sauce his entire life, decided that he was going to have a pregame meal at our house. So we gave him the Italian version. My mom made stuffed shells with ragu sauce from a jar. <laughs> We got to the second quarter and Tony left us. He spent two quarters in the bathroom <laughs> and he came back in the fourth quarter and said, I'm here and we said the game's over. <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> so Tony happened to say, I'll never eat at your mom's again. <laughs> there were two huge influences in my life that uh, defined my athletic career. One was my dear friend, H.A. Butterworth, who passed years ago. Um, another three-sport athlete, my best friend. We pushed each other, we competed with each other, but we were fiercely loyal to each other. He was extremely gifted, so it was tough for me. I had to work really hard, and he made me so much better. I miss him every day, and hopefully someday he makes his way here. The second was my brother, Steve. Steve, you want to pay attention? I'm going to give you a little airtime here. <laughs> Steve took me to play with his buddies when I was very little. He was four years older, and he always took me to play with his buddies. We played basketball, we played baseball, we played football. He would take me, but the one rule, rule is if you cry, you're not coming again. <laughs> so I figured out how not to ever let him see me cry. I cried, but I never cried in front of him. But those experiences and the toughness uh, that it developed in me um, allowed me to succeed. And it taught me never to fight and never to give up and to fight through obstacles and trust yourself. You probably have no idea how important it was, Steve, but it helped define me. Now, fortunately, I had the chance to show my appreciation to my brother. Uh, I was a senior and we were playing St. Joe's and the game went into triple overtime and at the time, Steve happened to be an assistant coach on the basketball team. I was the point guard. So we're down one. The gym's packed. Biggest rival. Got to win it. And um, I come down the lane, and I get hammered. I get knocked to the floor. No foul call. Under a minute left, and I look up and realize they just called a technical foul on us. So I look at the coach. The coach looking down the bench. Everybody's looking around. And I look at my brother, and he is in a chair. When I tell you if he could have got under the chair, he was white as a ghost. And I said, oh, my God, he just got a technical. So now it's redemption time, right? So they make the two foul shots. They go up by one, call timeout. Coach is not happy. Um, 
fortunately, I stole the ball, made a couple foul shots. We win the game. And the coach comes to me after the game and he says, just want to tell you that your brother's coaching career was over tonight <laughs> if you didn't make the two foul shots, just so we're clear. <laughs> so I think it's payback, Steve. I think we're even now. Right? <laughs> I feel so fortunate that my family had a chance to go through the prep experience with my son, Max. I'd always describe prep to them, but until Max went, it was just a story. Through his four years and all the games and involvement with prep, our entire family had come to understand what makes prep so special. The people, the families, the generosity, you don't find this anywhere else but at prep. And because Max played three sports, we were literally here every single day for four years. It was a family affair, truly it was. And I'd like to thank my family for sharing this experience. My beautiful wife, Celeste, my daughter, Maddie and Sean, Danny, Max, and our baby, Callie. By the way, we got a little negotiating to do. So Callie just graduated from eighth grade and she still believes that she's gonna go to prep. So we gotta, we gotta figure this out quick. We got uh, so I share this award with you all because I know you love this place as much as I do. To my son, Max, for allowing us to reconnect with prep. We loved every minute of your four years. I know you'll always ask, who was better, me or you? And where I'm very confident that you will have your day here, today the answer is <laughs> me. In closing, I'd like to share a couple comments made by a couple of classmates a few weeks ago. Uh, it was after the tragic death of one of our students. And as we stood at the church and watched our boys console each other, one of my friends said, this is truly when prep is at its best. My other friend quickly jumped in and said, boys, prep is always at its best. Again, I am honored to receive this recognition. I'm thrilled to be forever linked with my dad and to Fairfield Prep. Thank you. Sure did. <laughs> wow. Brian, your dad was a good friend to me when I was here at prep. We'll never forget him. Congratulations. Some athletes get better as they get older. And Chris Zingo is a prime example. The hard-hitting all-state linebacker was a defensive stalwart on the 1989 Fairfield Prep Class Double L Championship team, as, he, as well as a USA Today Honorable Mention All-American. But he attained much more success at the, key, at the collegiate level. Zingo was a two-time Associated Press Division AA All-American linebacker for Cornell, a three-time Ivy League, all Ivy League selection. He established many school records that still stand today. Incredibly, he registered 20 or more tackles in 11 games, averaging 17.1 tackles per game in 30 contests. Chris was inducted into the Cornell Hall of Fame in 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, please, Turn your attention to the big screen, big screen as we honor Chris Zingo. Christopher Zingo, class of 1990. I've known Chris for 40 years, so we played Little League baseball against each other. Actually, I met Chris for the first time officially when he ran me over at a play at the plate, which one wasn't allowed to do at that age, at that time and I got the worst of it, that's for sure. And I stood up and I had some choice words for Chris, which I wouldn't have said knowing what I do now. We were both thrown out of the game, and the next morning we had been chosen to play on a regional team out of that town team. And Chris came up to me in the parking lot and put his hand out and said, since we're on the same team, we might as well be friends. 
and we have been ever since. I think at Fairfield Prep, the, the thing you think about when you think of Chris Zingo is he was the toughest athlete any of us played with. He was intense, he only knew one speed, as Coach Maffei on the football field said, and this was an era where toughness was prized at Prep. We were coached by Earl Lavery, by Rich Magden, by uh, Bob Maffei, we had Ed Rowe as our baseball coach. These are legendary names in the prep community, and winning and toughness were the things one could put oneself into wholeheartedly, and we certainly did. I think the moment that stands out for me for Chris um, as an athlete at prep was the state championship football game, what would have been his junior year, where he played both linebacker and fullback uh, during that game, which was a game of inches. It was very low scoring. It was a tough game. And we ran about three plays at the time, run right, run left, and run center. And they were a lot of power. Um, and the defense, they kind of knew what we were going to do. The clock in there to win the class double L crown, seven to nothing, prep second title in this decade. Back in 82, they won it by beating, you guessed it, run it. So Chris was the focal point of that game for us. And, and you'd want Chris right in the middle of things. I think this has been true throughout his athletic career and, and certainly was the case when he played middle linebacker at Cornell. I saw Chris play in the Canadian Football League in a game in Shreveport, Louisiana when he was playing for the Pirates professionally and this was a team that was composed of predominantly all-American players from the top Division I colleges in the country from Michigan and Iowa and Florida, etc. He was coached by Forrest Gregg who was a Hall of Fame NFL coach. And Chris was the leader on that field. It was a very proud moment for me in supporting a friend who had gone on to do excellent things, athletically or otherwise. But Chris's life and, and the example and the success he's had as a person um, in business, in terms of his family life, I think that Chris has always shown. And, and to me, he, he also embodies something that the poet Robert Frost said, which is the best way around something is through it. Um, Chris probably took that a little too literally at the time. Certainly I didn't want to play football against him, realized that that was his pathway of choice. In any event, Chris, I want to congratulate you. I want to say that I'm very proud to be your friend. Um, I'm very proud to have known you as long as I have um, and have to, to have been in the circle of, of you and Gary and, and Lori and Randy. Um, you've all meant a lot to me over the years. So congratulations um, at this time. Um, I'd like to formally enshrine you into the Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame. And again, my, my sincere congrats to you and thanks for being such a good presence in my life over the years. Congrats, Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame welcomes Mr. Chris Zingo. Wow, I'm humbled. Thank you so much, Liam. That was amazing. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone, uh, particularly the committee who inducted me. I'm extremely honored to be inducted in such a prestigious institution. Um, I'm extremely grateful that my, my accomplishments are actually being acknowledged, both for what I did in high school, but beyond but in particular because look at the company I'm with. I mean, I'm in awe. It's... it's really amazing. Now, in life, we all share challenges. I mean, life is a challenging dynamic that we all go through. Now, the adversity that is the result of life actually builds character. And PrEP taught me that. I saw numerous pictures of Eddie Rowe, and Eddie Rowe is our baseball coach. And Eddie Rowe used to have his isms, right? Do you remember Eddie Rowe's isms? Well, one of his isms right, carried with me through the, my entire life. And uh, I'd like to see if you can guess it. What was one of his isms that he would say all the time? One of them that I personally liked was, everybody wants to go to heaven, but few realize you have to die first. <laughs> And he would say it over and over and over again, and we would roll our eyes and go, yeah, Eddie. But it always resonated with me, right? Starting for myself at birth, being born a three-pound premature twin where both my feet were inverted. My legs had to be broken, and I had to wear bars 
for two, three years of my life to learn how to walk. So I don't think athletics were in the cards for me, <laughs> right? And I think that's the reality. But uh, I had one thing that was pretty unique to me, is I had two parents that supported me unconditionally, right? no matter what it was. And they taught me two things. They taught me determination uh, coupled with humility. Because what those two combinations do is they allow you to achieve success despite your current limitations. Right? So they always forced me to work through my current limitations. Starting when I was seven years old and my mother, who's the one that suggested I should play football, took me to Wakens Boys Club and signed me up for football. Now she didn't know at the time that I was seven and the league was nine to 15. <laughs> but she said, I'm sick of you breaking the furniture in your house uh, and I'd like you to go do something constructive on the field, so I'm taking you. So she took me, and the headmaster was vehement. You cannot play. You're seven years old. This is nine. There are liability laws. My mother argued with him for an hour until he finally relented and said, kid, go pick out some equipment, be on the field at eight. Just get your mother out of here. Uh, and I said, okay. I grabbed it, and off we go. Now, the first practice, first practice, we practiced together, nine, 15, I'm seven. But I think I was 80 pounds, and I think that's the reason why he let me play. I was a little pudgy back then. And um, in the middle of the practice, my mother came running on the field, and she started yelling at the coach because she was upset that I wasn't running the ball. I was playing defense too much. And my mother had this vision of me scoring touchdowns. So she started yelling at the coach in front of everyone, and I was mortified said, I haven't seen my son Christopher carry the ball all day. And he said, okay, and he flipped it to me. And I looked over, and the 15-year-old kid with the beard and the zits, <laughs> and he was 6'2", and he's looking at me. And I said, thanks, Mom. Uh, he flipped me the ball, I started to run. I think I remember, he was about a foot away from me, and then I remember opening up my eyes and looking at the sky, and I couldn't breathe, and they're taking my pants off. And I'm hyperventilating. He knocked the wind out. You know, they knocked the wind out. Back, back in the day, we used to get the wind knocked out of us. We used to get our bell, our bell rung. Remember that? Not anymore. Um, and I remember my mother leaning over me in front of my entire team going, Pumpkin, I'm so sorry, Pumpkin. I'm so sorry. Breathe. Open your eyes. Uh, I was a Halloween baby, so she called me Pumpkin. Uh, and then since my entire class up through high school called me pumpkin. Um, they thought I liked it. I, I actually didn't like it. Um, and then my father, right, um, similar determination, humility, but my father pretty much sacrificed his entire life for his children. Uh, I don't recall a day that I wasn't at 3.30 after school in the backyard at the park playing either football, baseball, or basketball. Uh, 24-7. Uh, and I did have, I did have the, fortunate, uh, or the fortune to be able to share the home with probably one of the best athletes that I've ever seen, my brother, who I was able to use to push me, even though he was a year and a half younger. I always had to keep the older brother, you know, age and power, which uh, sometimes I'd look at him and go, if he doesn't know that... that he can kill me right now, I'm in trouble. Uh, so I kept that mindset. Um, but yes, definitely, um, I was really fortunate to have a family that, that, that um, really lived for their children, lived for the next generation. One more story about my mother because she passed, is that um, my mother was very academically or, uh, focused. My mother was a teacher at Harding High School. She was six degree. She was like one credit away from her PhD. And that's what she always valued. And when I was in high school, uh, I had scholarships. I had full scholarships to play either baseball or football at a few schools, numerous schools. Um, but I was fortunate enough to do well at school, and I had Ivy League schools recruiting me, but they didn't give athletic scholarships. Um, so my parents, as soon as that happened, they said, well, no, you're going to Ivy League. And my mother took a second job as an academic advisor at a nursing college, St. Vincent's in Bridgeport, uh, four nights a week from four to 11 at night, and her entire salary paid my Cornell. And it was the best decision we made as a family. 
Uh, but that's the type of parents that we have. Um, so for me, when I look out at the crowd and I look at just the overwhelming support, I look at my loving wife, Natalie. I look at my parents. I look at my brother. I look at my second brother, Tony. I look at my Fairfield Prep brethren, and I look at my extended work family who showed up in support. Um, and I say, well, that's what it's about, and that's what I am eternally grateful for. So thank you. Really appreciate being part of this organization. Congratulations, Chris. I think your mother might have known my mother. <laughs> I have similar stories. Ladies, excuse me, from his arrival as a, uh, a physical education teacher here at Prep and a freshman football coach in 1973 until his departure as athletic director in 2009, Bob Harris has left an indelible mark on the school's athletic history. Harris was an assistant football coach, assistant coach in both football and baseball, and he spent 30 years as the school's athletic director, which is a laudable accomplishment in itself. But his success, but his success as the Jesuits' tennis coach is just plain remarkable. Under his guidance, Prep won 10 state championships, 12 class double L titles, between 1986 and 2003. Harris also mentored a host of All-Staters and All-Americans, among them Brad Norton from the class of 86, Mike Passarella from 95, Todd Paul in the class of 2003, and the 2019 Prep Athletic Hall of Fame inductee, Mike Sprouse from the class of 1992. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screens as we honor, well, my athletic director, my phys ed teacher, Mr. Bob Harris. Robert Harris. I have known Bob for over 40 years, both as a friend, as an employer when I was a referee, and as a parent for both of my sons who were students at Fairfield Prep. Bob has had a very close relationship with Fairfield Prep for close to 50 years. He's had multiple roles, both as a teacher, a baseball coach, a football coach, a tennis coach, and most importantly, he was the athletic uh, director for this school for over 30 years. He dealt with all of the coaches during that period of time. He dealt with 30 years of trying to find fields, weather conditions, and in an era that there were no cell phones, and he was able to do that by himself with a lot of dignity, a lot of class, and a lot of interaction with uh, people. Most importantly, he impacted hundreds and hundreds of student athletes, their lives, their actions, and their accomplishments on and off the field. He did it with dignity, he did it with calm, and he did it professionally. So I think Fairfield Prep meant so much to him, uh, and re in reverse, Fairfield Prep benefited so much from him. Bob was uh, honored in 2001 as the Athletic Director of the Year by the State of Connecticut Athletic Association, and uh, he was obviously admired substantially uh, by his fellow athletic directors. When I came here as a referee, we were treated in a respectful manner. If there were any issues with the game, he was always there to help solve the problem, and it was, he was just that type of guy. He was a, a professional, person who really wanted to do a good job and wanted everybody else to do it right. You know, Bob's not a, a man that shows his accomplishments on his shoulder, but I think internally that this is probably 
a very high honor for him. He's given so much of his life for Fairfield Prep and to be honored by them uh, is, I think, a, a great honor for him. My name is Steve Dunahue, and it is an honor to present my friend, Bob Harris, for enshrinement into the Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame welcomes Mr. Bob Harris. Thank you, everyone. This is a, truly an honor. Jeff, thank you for your hosting tonight. Christian, thank you very much. I'm going to echo some of the things that have been said already. Um, let me first say thank you to Steve Donahue. As he said in the video, we've been friends for a long time, and our relationship has been in many different ways, uh, certainly as a friend, as an attorney, as counsel for the school, and, and dealing with issues regarding Fairfield Prep, as a football official, as a basketball official. So across a wide range of uh, interactions, Steve has always been there and has been an outstanding representative for Fairfield Prep. I'd also like to thank the selection committee. Um, I know the work that goes into it, and I greatly appreciate the time and the effort that they spend to take a look at Prep's outstanding athletes from the past and inducting them into this. And for me, it's an honor to be uh, selected by them. To the development office, in particular to Kathy Norell and her staff, I know what work goes into these kinds of events because I organized them for many, many years in different sports dinners. So, to Kathy and your staff, thank you so much. <laughs> to the other inductees for this year, congratulations to all of you. Uh, I saw some of you play, some of you I did not, but I certainly heard all about um, the previous generations of athletes from Fairfield Prep. So I want to congratulate all of you for your outstanding contributions. As an administrator, you work with all sorts of people. First and foremost, you work with your headmaster or now president to help you run the programs and do the best you can do. And without those leaders at the principal or headmaster position, uh, that would be a diff difficult task. All of them, bar none, were supportive to me, listened to me, sometimes agreed, occasionally did not, but they were always there and they always wanted, for Fairfield Prep, the best for the student athlete. That's where my focus was and I greatly appreciate the leadership that I got. Not only from the principals and headmasters and presidents has the terminology changed, there are many, many other administrators who are of great assistance to me. I always had somebody that I could turn to for advice, counsel. I could turn to them for help with covering things. For example, I had to go to many different state meetings, state tournaments, or whatnot. And I always could pick up the phone and I could ask a Richie Magden or a John Brennan, I need your help. And they were always there. It's dangerous to name individual names, but those two guys and myself, I think we had a little triumvirate going where we could count on each other. So to those administrators, I appreciate everything that you did to help me do for Fairfield Prep what I could. Coaches, 
Over the course of the years, many, many coaches, head coaches, assistant coaches, volunteer coaches, they are the backbone along with the athlete, the student athlete, that gets the job done. So to all of the coaches that I have ever had the opportunity to work with, thank you. Uh, I greatly appreciate what you have done. And if I was able to help you in some small way, then I feel fulfilled. Many of you had a history of Fairfield Prep or a knowledge of Fairfield Prep perhaps before you came here. Certainly, Brian, you did. Well, I grew up a long home run or a, maybe a, a driver away from here, literally a couple hundred yards down the street on the other side of North Benson. I never had to walk up and down it, but I crossed it many times to come here onto the property and I remember the band shell and seeing concerts. I remember New York Giants when they trained here. But in all honesty, I had no clue about Fairfield Prep. I was geared to public school. I ended up going to Roger Ludlow High School. I think I had one friend from high school who lived down the street who went to Fairfield Prep, and that was it. I always took guidance and leadership from my coaches, one of whom was a gentleman named Emil Taft at Roger Ludlow. I kind of always wanted to be like an Emil Taft, and I thought he was a special person. I ended up getting a summer job working at a camp that he was co-owner of, and I met another gentleman who was the other co-owner named Fern Tetro, who was at Andrew Ward. And these were guys who all of a sudden became, although I didn't know him at the time, the Earl Lavery of Fairfield Prep, the Joe Brosley, those guys. And I thought I would be on a track to go to Fairfield uh, Public Schools. Well, as it turned out, fortunately, very fortunately, I got a phone call from Tim McGillicuddy. He was the acting principal at the time, and there was a position open, brand new position for a phys ed teacher, and that's what I had trained to do. I had gone to Southern Connecticut State College, I had gone to Springfield College, and I was influenced by those Springfield grads, Emil Taft and Fern Tetro. But where do I end up? I end up at Fairfield Prep. It was the best decision for me that I could have imagined. If you're gonna do what I ended up doing, working over a 30 year period at a high school, then Fairfield Prep turned out to be the place to be. And everything that I've heard tonight about prep, the pride, the tradition, everything, I feel now a part of. There's a certain part of you that says when you don't go to prep, well, you know, do you really kind of belong? Tonight was the night that I feel truly a member of the community. One of the things I had to try to establish early on was, you know, what is my philosophy or what is my role at Fairfield Prep? And as an administrator, particularly as the athletic director, it really comes down to doing a lot of the things that nobody sees. Steve, you see them because you were on the field as an official. Uh, some of the coaches know because we interact and communicate, but a lot of people simply just don't know what goes into it. The university created a uh, particular uh, challenge because we had to share facilities, which we didn't own, which were difficult sometimes to negotiate for. But in the end, we managed to pull it off and to get those teams out on the field, whether it was alumni field or alumni diamond or, or alumni hall for that matter. 
So we got out there and we tried to do the things to make the programs viable, be able to give our student athletes the opportunity to be on the field and, and get the job, their job done. Those are some of the things that, in my mind, are of significant importance. The interactions with the different departments at the university. I had to interact with uh, the Office of Public Safety, with the maintenance and grounds, with the coaching staff at the university, which had their own priorities. And yet, with the cooperation of everybody, I think we got the majority of the, the the things that we wanted to get at the time. I had recognition tonight, or I'm having recognition for two things. One is the athletic director and the other is the tennis coach. I never really had intended to be the tennis coach, but when Father Ron Perry stepped down from his position, I decided, well, since I do have an interest in tennis, I would try to fill that job myself thinking that perhaps along the way somebody would come on staff. Well, it turns out that that person didn't come on until roughly 2009. So for 20, 20 plus years, uh, I was the coach. We had a tremendous amount of success. We won multiple state championships. We won multiple singles championships, doubles championships and we had a very high level of performance against our state competitors. And I'm extremely proud of that, but I realize clearly that the guys on the court, the ones hitting the ball and the serves and everything, those were the true heroes of those teams. And I'm glad that I was able to facilitate uh, their performance and their success uh, on the state level. The other aspect of my job, and I've mentioned it, is the, um, the athletic director position. I talked about facilities, I've talked about interacting with departments. Things that I had to try to focus on were budget, coaching staff, expanding coaching staff, increasing um, salaries for coaching staff. And I couldn't have done those things without the cooperation of the administration, which I've already mentioned. But those were some of the things that I thought was important to focus in on. And what we were trying to do was to create the structure, the infrastructure, to make them successful. Another thing that I'm particularly proud of, and I hope that PrEP has benefited from it, is that we have expanded during my tenure anyway, and I think it continues, the offerings that Fairfield Prep presents to the student athlete. There was a time when you talk primarily football, baseball, basketball. There was a little bit of soccer. There was certainly swimming, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple. But there's skiing now. There's crew. There's sailing. There's wrestling, there's rugby, and it goes on and on. And some of those things just simply didn't exist. Now, I'm not saying I started the rugby team and I'm not saying that I started any of those other sports, but what I realized was the importance of expanding the opportunities for the student athlete so that we could get a higher level of participation. I think we were hitting 65, 70, 70 percent of the student body engaged in some one sport at least. And that I thought was significant because I flash back to when I first came on board, Earl Avery was the football coach and I asked him for guidance, what do you want from me as a freshman? Take about 30 boys, identify six to eight who will be the nucleus four years from now, give them half a dozen at the most running plays, and they were power left, power right, power up the middle. <laughs> and you're probably not gonna have a quarterback that can throw downfield, so just a little flare pass out to the side. That was pretty much it. So in the first couple of years, all these young men come out, 
Brian was one of them. And I had to cut kids. And that was kind of a very uncomfortable thing to have to do. In the back of my mind, I, I didn't know how I was going to keep 100 kids on the freshman team, but I knew we needed more spots for players. And it wouldn't, wasn't always going to be in football. It was going to end up being in some other sport. Rugby came along. There were about 40 boys trying to play rugby. Um, we had to find a way. We managed. Wrestling. Wrestling came along. If it wasn't for Fairfield Country Day, I'm not sure we could have pulled it off because the nucleus of the, of the starting wrestling team came from Fairfield Country Day. But that was the focus of what I tried to do behind the scenes. Create infrastructure, expand programming, engage more people, get the parents involved, and work with the administration to pull it all together and make it happen. So that was, that was where I was coming from, and I hope that it was successful. I think it was, I feel it was, and I want to thank everybody for your contributions to Fairfield Prep. Again, I'll say I am proud to be a member of the Fairfield Prep community. I'm very proud to have been recognized and honored by the selection committee. And again, I'll congratulate all the other inductees for their success and their recognition tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't mess your no, no, we're good. Thank you, Coach. The 1997 cross country team was one of the best in Fairfield Prep history. It wound up ranked 15th nationally and featured four All State Harriers, one freshman. Brian McGovern would go on to become a four-time All-Stater and an All-American. The other standouts included senior Tri-Captain John Thomas and junior Colin Rochford, both two-time All-Staters, and senior John Coniers, and, all, and also an All-State selection. The team boasted an 8-1 dual meet record and captured the SCC championship the Class Double L State Championship, the State Open, and finished second in the New Englands. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screens as we honor the 1997 cross country team. The 1997 cross country team. You know, Fairfield Prep is a formative place, but it's a formative place because of the experiences that we have and different groups have different experiences. A guy on the football team is going to swear that his formative experience was the best possible. And somebody on the swim team is probably going to say the same thing. It's too bad they're wrong because the cross country team was the best possible formative experience. For me, the significant event wasn't during 97. It was at the end of the 96 season. We'd had some success. We'd never won a state championship, but we'd managed to finish third in the state and then in 1996, and we're looking ahead to the next year, and it seemed obvious to everybody who paid attention to cross country that in 1997, Xavier High School of Middletown would be the state champion, and Fairfield Prep would be the runner-up, and whoever was number three would be way behind. And the season ended, and we were all happy in 1996 with how well we had done, but I posed the, uh, a really serious question to the guys of, are you willing to be second, or do you want to take a shot at being first? And the guys resoundingly made a commitment to do what they needed to do to beat Xavier, who we knew was going to be a nationally ranked team. And it started with the indoor track season, and it started with some very hard work in the weight room, but that hard work went through the indoor track season, the outdoor track season of 97, and then through the summer. And when we came back, we knew we had something special going on. And our first meet of the year uh, was at a, the Wilton Invitational. 
and the Wilton Invitational is usually a bunch of teams from Fairfield County. And who shows up at the meet but Xavier High School? And I asked their coach, because he only came with seven guys. I said, what are you doing here? And he says, this is where you are. So, so we came for you. And we beat them. And we beat them well enough that the guys knew that the hard work had paid off thus far, but they were also fully aware that they would have to keep that going. And we went through the season running really well. And our times were wonderful. And there was a national publication that ranked high school teams. And all of a sudden, we're in national rankings. And that continued throughout the season. And the nice thing is it carried over into the year after, because we won a state championship again in the year after, even though we graduated a whole bunch of really good seniors who went on to run in college. And so my memory isn't so much one thing, it's this general attitude and how they carried that forward. Being inducted into the Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame is important because the very hard work that these fellows went through is being recognized on a much more public stage. And we all know that cross country is not a, uh, it's not a big spectator sport since part of the requirement is that you have to run from one place to another. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of excitement I like seeing them get this recognition, and, and I hope there's further recognition for individuals down the road. My name is Bob Ford, Jr., and it's my pleasure to present our 1997 cross-country team for enshrinement into the Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fairfield Prep Athletic Hall of Fame welcomes the 1997 cross-country team. I'd like to call to the podium's captain, Chris Scapoletto and John Thomas to speak on behalf of the team. Hello? Hey. I feel like I'm uh, back at prep doing my homework. Before class, I uh, wrote this over dinner. <laughs> so yeah, uh, XC is definitely not used to being uh, top billing, so uh, thank you. Uh, you know, actually none of us from the 97 team were the best runners in uh, Fairfield Prep history. Uh, many who have come after us have uh, taken our record since. Um, and I think that's fitting. Most of us didn't actually come to the team as runners. Uh, many of us actually came from after getting cut from other sports. I, uh, I personally, I was indecisive about what I wanted to try out for. So I uh, left my house on Pembroke Drive, which is about a mile from here, with a pair of cleats and a pair of running shoes. And I figured I'd uh, make the decision when I got there. And uh, at the end of my street, an upperclassman pulled up in a convertible. And he saw me, I guess, carrying my cleats. And he said, oh, I'm on the soccer team. Are you, are you a soccer player? Do you want to ride? 
And I thought about walking the mile to school, and uh, I made the decision right there, yeah, I'm a soccer player. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I got caught and made my way to cross country. And it, it's funny to think a guy who didn't want to walk a mile, uh, you know, four years later would, uh, you know, be running 100 mile weeks and, uh, you know, help lead the team to the championship. Uh, we didn't look like runners. We refused to wear the short shorts. We won most of our meets wearing basketball shorts. Um, we were a team that were really more than the sum of our parts. Uh, you know, one of the, the most essential parts of that equation was definitely our coaches. Uh, Bob Ford Jr., he just heard speak, and his father, uh, Bob Ford Sr., or Ford Jr. and Ford Sr., as we called him. Uh, both of these men gave countless hours of their personal time on buses and vans with a bunch of, you know, pain in the ass teenagers that smelled bad after running. Uh, Ford Sr. in his retirement and Ford Jr. as a father of a young family. Uh, and I've really grown to appreciate, uh, you know, Ford Jr.'s sacrifice now myself as a young father uh, even more. I have two kids and I was 45 minutes late tonight just trying to get them out the door. Um, and, you know, he was coaching us with four, so uh, I, I don't know how he did it. But really, the combination of their personalities, uh, the heart and the science, is uh, the secret sauce in our success. Well, the second part was definitely the hard work. Uh, you know, as uh, Coach Ford said, we made a conscious decision in his classroom that we were going to win states. Uh, we made a plan, and then we worked that plan for the next 12 months, often before the sun came up and, uh, you know, after it had went down. And the last was friendship. Uh, you know, on those back loops and on the crest of those hills, when you're really hurting, you know, those demons can come into your head and whisper, give up, slow down. But I don't think any of us ever did. Uh, maybe if we were running just for ourselves, we would have, but we were running for each other. We never wanted to let each other down. Um, you know, I'm sure Ford Jr. as a, a bioscience teacher would uh, contest this statement, but, you know, I always say that, you know, running was written into our DNA, running all those miles as teenagers. We're all still very competitive. Uh, I think if put to the test, we think we could at least hit our freshman year PRs. Uh, <laughs> we still race each other every year at the, uh, the uh, turkey trot. You can come see us. We've got a trophy. Uh, but I think, yeah, I'm surprised it's not here. Uh, Matt has it. I'll be taking it back this year, though. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I think right alongside that is, you know, written alongside and in our DNA is those friendships. And I uh, couldn't be more honored to, uh, you know, share this uh, with the guys tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Now, let's give a big round of applause, a big standing ovation for all of the 2022 Athletic Hall of Fame inductees. What an evening. It doesn't get better than this. Now, my, my Latin President Cashman is really rusty. So, ad majorum de iglorium. It, those words follow me everywhere I go. And as Father Murphy taught us, we may laugh, we may cry, we never say die. Let's go, Fairfield. Fairfield, let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the 2022 Athletic Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Thank you for joining us for this very special evening. We hope you've enjoyed yourself. Have a great night. Be safe. Godspeed. Go prep. Good night, all.